She's I'm Barbara, Barbara Coor. I'm John. This is John Plunkett. He's better at the logistics, but so we're here at Hatch. And um, thank you very much, Doubletree, for that lovely space that we were able to sit and work in yesterday. And I had the pleasure yesterday of meeting many of you, but my partner was not able to make it till today. So first, I'd like to introduce John. Hi. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really I sorry uh, that I missed the last day or two from what Barbara said. It's, it's really been a, a good uh, mind meld. So anyway, as, as some of you know, uh, we helped found uh, Wired Magazine and were the creative directors of it for the first five years. And uh, we could certainly talk about that experience, uh, about creating Wired. And to, and to some degree we're going to, but that's not really our point today. Yeah, today we want to talk about something different. We want to talk about where you create. John and I have been lucky that we've worked in and shaped a lot of different workspaces. But it's made us think a lot about the pros and cons of different types of space, and especially the where, where you create for yourself. That's yours. And this is a great space, by the way. Uh, oh, yeah, I got to interrupt. <laughs> Please. <laughs> thank you so much for making this space for you. It's a wonderful little space. And thank you for All Steel for supplying the props to sit us all in here, too. OK. So Barbara sent me this picture of the, the barn you guys were in the other night, uh, which looks like a beautiful space. Um, you know, sometimes where, where you create happens by default or out of necessity, maybe most of the time. Uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, you can choose to make those spaces very deliberately, like you have with this room. Either way, the nature of the place where you make stuff has a huge effect on the stuff that you make. So that's our, one of our questions today, is, is where do you do your best thinking? Uh, you know, you might say the, the uh, space in your mind. In fact, it has to be the space in your mind, doesn't it? Hopefully, uh, it's uh, your, uh, your heart as well. But how is your personal creative space affected by the spaces that you work in? Okay, here's our studio in Park City, Utah. John and I moved to Park City about 20 years ago. And over time, we've rebuilt a number of old mining shacks from the inside out. We live in one, we work in one, and we're rebuilding a third one right at the moment. So sometimes our space looks like this, but more often it looks like this. And it's like a lot of people's spaces. It looks it's even worse today. <laughs> she doesn't know that. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's messy and it's chaotic, but sometimes that's a good thing. Like when you're executing on an idea and you need to just push through that thought. But sometimes, for me anyway, it's just too much going on and I can't even hear myself think. That's when I get in the car. And I think we were talking a little bit about this the other day, is how do you create a space in your mind to think, to do the really, really hard working that we're trying to do here. So for me, I go for a drive. Some of my best ideas come while driving. Why is this? For me, it's a space where I can be alone. It's a space where I can relax, but I need to stay alert. So put it simply, it's quiet, I'm not distracted, and if I turn off the phone, I'm not interrupted. But that's the opposite of most workspaces, as we were hearing this morning with the all steel presentation. But what I'd like to do is look at some of the most famous places where great creative work happened. Just a little few of them. Here's our pal Grant, that's Steve Jobs. And he, used to, he said here that he did most of his best thinking in a room with no furniture, where he could meditate. But Steve said this several years after Apple had become a successful company. You wouldn't guess that anything amazing happened in this suburban garage, but Jobs and Steve Wozniak created the first com personal computer here in his parents' garage. There's a nice pixelated picture of him. And here's a nice picture of the interior of the garage. There's a great tradition in Silicon Valley of big ideas starting in small garages. Here's another one. In 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin started Google in this Menlo Park garage while they were still students at Stanford. I don't have a picture of the interior of it 
Oh, I do. Sure John do. found it. I forgot. All right. First, it was just the two of them in a garage, but we know the story here. It's a company that now employs over 30,000 people worldwide. This is uh, Googleplex. This is their, uh, one of their buildings in uh, Mountain View, California. About 10,000 people work at this uh, not in this building, but in the Googleplex compound. This is the gymnasium. It's called Building 40. Now here, I can see from the photos, as companies grow, they tend to get more corporate, right? They can be fun, but work and play in spaces like this become more official, more grown up, just more corporate. It's a natural, a, a natural evolution but it's not exactly the casual or messy spaces of colleges and garages. And there's a, a question here, that uh, one that Barbara and I have chewed on a lot, which is that as much as companies want to, uh, they can't really legislate you know, where and when fun or creativity are going to happen. And as far as we know, creating something new can be fun, but it's mainly a lot of hard work, persistence, stress, and luck. The most fun usually happens in spaces that are made, uh, not for fun, but, but that are made for hard work. Uh, I want to show you a legendary hardworking space. This is called Building 22. It's a building that no longer exists, but it was at MIT for 55 years. It's a building that Stuart Brand talked about in his book, How Buildings Learn. It was hastily constructed during World War II for engineers working on radiology. Always regarded as temporary, it never got a formal name. It was called the Rad Lab at first because it ho housed the radiation laboratory. During World War II, nine Nobel Prize winners and over 20% of the uh, all US physicists worked out of this building. Now, after World War II, the building served as a magical incubator for small MIT programs and research. What you've got to see here is that it was cold, drafty, and really ugly. It had a, so, but according to Stuart Brand, it was unusually loved by those who worked in it. Why? It was very basic. It had one of the qualities that AJ was talking about this morning. It had long corridors that forced people to bump into each other. So everybody eventually knew what everyone else was working on. But it also had something that they really liked, which was private offices. Offices that they could retreat into and be alone to do their work. But one of the more interesting things about it was that it was considered a temporary building. Because it was cheap and temporary, Nobody complained about damaging any fancy, expensive architecture. People punch holes in the ceilings. They moved entire walls. They create windows so they could see each other for whatever project they were working on. The building allowed people to create their own workspace. And like the, the subtitle here says, it had a righteous, nerdly swagger. <laughs> and that's something that I think we need to hold on to. John and I have learned through necessity about this idea of creating temporary spaces, especially when we started Wired with our friends Lewis and Jane and learned literally or virtually no money. Yeah, and like uh, most overnight successes, Wired was anything but. Our pal Lewis Rosetto came up with the idea that technology would someday rather soon become the dominant force in our culture, but it took us five years from that inside of Lewis's and, and several different workspaces before we were able to launch the first issue in 1993. We made the prototype for Wired in, in this building in 1991. It was our first office in uh, New York in the meat market district uh, when, it was, when it still really was the meat market. <coughs> the building next door, I should go back. The building next door there uh, at that time was a uh, garbage company. It's, it's now uh, a, an art gallery, so it shows, shows you how the times change. Anyway, we worked with Lewis over four or five days and nights to uh, craft a story in words and pictures that we could use to sell to potential investors to, to persuade them that we knew a secret about the future. Mm -hmm. The space we rented from our pal, the photographer Neil Selkirk, which you see in this photo, was a tiny, 
dark. The neighborhood was a little dangerous at night. It was a strange place to be building uh, Wired's happy, shiny future. Uh, but we made this prototype. It was a 16-page manifesto of sorts, but, but aimed towards investors um, rather than readers. Lewis and his partner, Jane Metcalf, spent the next uh, 18 months showing the manifesto around. And uh, finally, after being turned down by every publisher on the planet, we got some seed money from uh, Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of MIT Media Lab. Nicholas, of course, understood what we were talking about because essentially we were merely reflecting back to him what he'd been doing with the Media Lab for 10 or 15 years at that point. <clears throat> so in the fall of 1992, we, uh, the four of us headed to Silicon Valley and San Francisco to see if we could make something called Wired happen. And the top floor of this warehouse was our first home. This is in uh, San Francisco's South Park. At the time, it was another sketchy neighborhood. This was about mm -hmm. seven years before dot-com fever that really cleaned up the place. But uh, for, the, for the first five of those, it was, it was pretty dubious digs. Uh, and for Barbara and me, it was literally our home. For the first year, we, we slept in our office on a fold-out futon. There was a tiny kitchen and a shower, so we just had to make sure we were clothed before anybody showed up. And, and luckily, people didn't show up till fairly late in the morning, so, mm -hmm. so it all worked out. Um, <clears throat> we stayed in this uh, sort of crappy situation for eight or nine months until one night our, our pre-press guy knocked on the door at 4.30 in the morning with a question for me. And, the next morning, I went out to find us an apartment in the neighborhood. And at that point, we were starting to believe that maybe, maybe Wired wouldn't fail, maybe it would succeed, and so we thought mm -hmm. we could take a chance on paying some rent. Oh, so Wired started with the four of us, and then uh, 12 people to make the first issue, and by the end of the year, we were up to 50. It was strictly BYOC, bring your own computer. And, it's, and it was as close to 24-7 as we ever got for a few years there. A desk were sawed down uh, doors. panel doors, uh, sitting on surplus file cabinets. Everything else you see in the picture was equally secondhand, cheap, random, whatever we could find. Uh, Barbara and I uh, had built a chain link fence at the top of the stairs of this building mm. to keep us safe at night after a few interesting visitors. Mm. In other words, the first year was classic startup. While the world welcomed Wired and celebrated our success, we were struggling to survive that gap between a good idea and revenue. Uh, so each month in 1993 felt like it might be the last. The, the, the permanent question was, how do we pay the printer? How do we buy the paper? <clears throat> uh, here's the uh, space plan that Barbara and I uh, drew up for our first expansion, mm -hmm. big expansion of the business. We were four, then we were 12, now we we're planning to go to 38. The note at the top says, uh, uh, it sort of states the goal, maximum desks with minimum demolition. In other words, how little could we spend? Tr true startup mentality. But the key thing here is the open plan. Everybody squeezed together in one big space with very few offices. I was first exposed to this idea of open plan working when I worked for uh, the British design company Pentagram in 1980. They opened their New York office. Colin Forbes, who's the gentleman up front in the white shirt, uh, he's, he was, uh, and well, really still is, the brains behind Pentagram. It was his idea to combine lots of small design teams with a shared administrative and PR uh, engine, uh, and that's what became Pentagram. Uh, Colin was also a firm believer in open spaces uh, as a way to flatten hierarchy and prevent turf wars and just keep everything literally uh, out in the open, transparent. Uh, Colin also wanted a kitchen and a cook. Now I asked him how could his little company afford such an extravagance? And he asked me if I had any idea of how many uh, work hours were lost when people left every day for lunch. Uh, so to him, the small cost of providing free food paid off in all kinds of ways, from more work hours on a practical level to better working friendships made over a, a daily meal with a, a team that got more closely knit for that reason. Uh, so that was a model we wanted to bring to Wired uh, w once we could figure out how to pay for it. Now Colin also liked the open plan because he believed it required everyone to be very tidy. If, if everything's out in the open, then you must put everything away because otherwise it, it just wouldn't function. Uh, that is one theory that did not, did not translate very well to Wired <laughs> and especially to Hotwired. <laughs> 
Uh, once the World Wide Web came along, our little, big ma little ba magazine business morphed into R&D for websites, whatever they were. Uh, we made the first uh, commercial website with original content and advertising, uh, Hotwired, which launched in the fall of 94 on the Mosaic browser uh, because Netscape hadn't come out with their browser at that point. Uh, that, we followed that then with the, the search engine Hotbot, uh, a website that taught people how to make websites called WebMonkey, and, and many, many more. But mainly our company grew. And as we grew, we got messier and louder. <coughs> We had a rule on the magazine side. Uh, uh, basically, there was music blaring as, as long as there were humans in the building that were awake. And the, and the rule was if you, if you didn't like a song, you could take it off, but you had to put another song on. So, that, so you know, Wired was like this for the five years that we were there. <coughs> uh, the 38 magazine people were joined then by a team of 14 uh, to start Hot Wired. And then 50 became 100, 200, and then 300 people. Uh, Three years after we launched with four of us, we had 300 people. The picture above was our first hot-wired space, and you can see strewn overhead is the uh, uh, pink uh, Ethernet ca cable. So at this point in 1995, 96, you know, people were starting to hear or read about this thing called the World Wide Web, and so visitor, visitors would come in, and they'd walk into our office, and they'd see these pink cables, and they'd go, is that the Internet? And we'd say... Yeah, <laughs> that's the internet. But now Barbara and I had a third full-time job uh, in addition to making magazines and making websites, which are the things that we see as our main focus. We view ourselves as you know, people who tell stories with words and pictures. But we had this third full-time job of space planning on the fly for this beast that wouldn't quit uh, expanding. The color coding on this uh, floor plan represents future hires and the timing of their hires, sort of first, second, third, fourth waves there. And if you look close, you can see lots of uh, names of people who've become uh, well-known since then, uh, coming out of our little digital hothouse. Mark Froenfelder, who uh, is the founder of Boing Boing, uh, Doug Bowman, who's currently the creative director for Twitter, and especially June Cohen, who uh, is, is the person who brought free TED Talks to the web and to all of us. <coughs> So the thing for Barbara and I is, in the midst of all this chaos, this is two or three years in now, we realized we, needed, uh, we really needed to make time to do the part we loved. There was huge pressure on us to, um, <clears throat> to sort of take on more of a managerial administrative role. And, and I think this is always a challenge for creatives as they get further along in their careers, is, how in the world do you keep doing the part that you actually love to do instead of all the other stuff? We started referring to the design as the magic 2%, mm. and the other 98% we just did. But anyway, anyway, this caused us to look for a place. Uh, um, and, you know, as exciting as the wired offices were, we needed some other kind of place as a pressure release valve. <clears throat> and we found it in this little uh, miner shack in Park City, Utah. The Wired folks thought we were completely crazy to go back and forth every three or four days between San Francisco and Park City, 90-minute plane, plane fight. But it was precisely this balance between the chaos of the Wired offices, where we'd go to have meetings and get yelled at and yell at people, huh. and then the quiet back at our house that where we could decompress, recharge our batteries, and, and actually do most of our design work. So it's funny to think that so much of Wired's you know, f futuristic message was made first in that tiny, dark little New York office, then a fairly dingy San Francisco warehouse, and then finally in the back room of this 100-year-old shack. So Wired is, it's, you know, Barbara and I have been doing design for 20 years. Wired's still probably the most visible part of its work, maybe just by its nature. But probably the most interesting to us and the least visible is the space planning work we continue to do. Nowadays, it's primarily for private residences. This is the current project, restoring the outside of a historic house while making the interior entirely modern. This is the reason John couldn't join us today as well. Until today, it's sorry. All, it's all the builder's fault. Uh, so what's the point of all this? Churchill said that we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. So we wish you the best of luck in first finding and then especially in creating 
the kind of spaces that will give you just the right amount of controlled chaos and just the right amount of quiet relaxation. And that will help you to create your very best work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Answer? Uh, what was your connection with Mondo 2000? Or was there one? <laughs> um, not much of any, really. It, you know, um, the one thing that Mondo and Wired had in common is uh, their editors <laughs> hired some of the same writers that Wired did. Um, uh, you know, our executive editor was Kevin Kelly, and he came from the Whole Earth Review. So Kevin had his stable of writers, and uh, Mondo 2000 had theirs, and there was overlap. Um, Wired was kind of like uh, the Whole Earth Review uh, as a comic book, you know, full-color version of the Whole Earth Review. So we probably had much more of a connection to the Whole Earth Review in our minds, uh, not, not much to Boing Boing. They, they felt... We were aiming for a national audience. Mondo, and, uh, Mondo. I'm sorry, to Mondo, yeah. We were aiming for a national audience, and I think they probably had a much uh, narrower focus. There was one other connection, which is for a while, not uh, for a brief while, we shared space in the same building. With yeah, they were downstairs. You didn't even know that. I think you're, you're thinking of Boing Boing. No. no. So not much of a connection, apparently. <laughs> about the process. I mean, space is important. I love what you've done. But within these spaces, there's a process that you use the work to create. Can you talk about your, your process? The process is? It's chaos. No. John, you... Well, um, we use this term uh, uh, content-based design. And all we mean is it's, everybody has a different way of saying the same, same idea that that each problem has something unique about it, and if you can figure out what that is and then make that visible to other people, you greatly increase the chances of it, its success. So in the case of Wired, it, it was, it, in some ways it was an easier design problem than many because how often are, are people asked to help visualize the future? So, so our job with Wired was, was just to, you, you have to dial, your, dial, dial yourself back. Um, 20 years. Next January, it'll be 20 years since the magazine launched. So all the devices that we have right now and all the programs that we're running on these things, think about it. A few years ago, you didn't have Facebook. You didn't have Twitter. A couple more years, you didn't have the iPhone. How did, how did, how did business occur before this, this existed? You dial that back a little bit further, uh, you don't have the World Wide Web, and you don't have email, and then you don't have a computer. So that was the context when we started Wired. You know, most people didn't have a computer, didn't want a computer, it wasn't on their radar screen. So our job was to say, you're probably going to want to get a computer, uh, you're probably going to be using this thing called email, there's going, to be this, you know, there's going to be access to this thing called the internet, it's going to create a networked way of working. Um, One thing that John and I looked at a lot when we first started it was that the magazines that were talking about technology were talking about the boxes, they weren't talking about the people behind those boxes. And what John always talked about is, I'm going to make those nerds rock stars, because they are. These are people that are behind, the thinkers behind what was being created, all these devices and all this stuff. So he deliberately, when he started working at the magazine and, and doing the photo shoots, would say, you can't ever put a, a computer in it. Don't put any of the technology in. I just want to see the, the people. Yeah. But back to your question about process. We're probably digressing. Well, when we talk to students, uh, we'll talk about something we call the, the three C's. Content, context, and continuity. The content I already touched on. You know, what is unique about the problem you're dealing with? <clears throat> if you can define that and then come up with ways to make that, con that unique content visible to others, um, you've, you've come further than most people. Um, you know, lots of people talk about design, and we talk about it all different ways, and we mean all sorts of different things. Uh, um, to us, you know, design is not about uh, fashion and, and decor and wallpaper. That's an aspect of design, but we're much more interested in trying to solve an actual problem and change something in the, in the real world. So that's what the, the
the content focus is that, that we, we try to make the lead horse. But then, almost as a technique issue, the next issue is context. In other words, uh, <clears throat> who's the competition? Uh, or, or rather, what's the mindset of the, of the people we're trying to reach? You know, we ask ourselves that question. Who do we want, who are we talking to and what would we like them to do? We try to keep it that simple. Um, but the main thing about context is, uh, and, and the main strategy there is, it's not rocket science, is if, if you can identify what your competition is doing, um, generally it's human nature, this herd mentality. And uh, if something's working, everybody else tends to do the same thing. So if you have a given context, let's take Wired for instance, in 1992, we looked at the magazines on the newsstand that Wired would be up against. It turned out that all the magazines kind of looked the same. To tell you the truth, I think it still is that situation. You could take the logos on magazines on the newsstand today, if you can find a newsstand, and you could switch them around and it wouldn't make much difference. You know, magazines have a certain, you know, codified way of looking. <clears throat> so that, uh, so in terms of context, we try to figure out, well, what is the context? And then, and then that becomes our list of things to not do. If all magazines are, are uh, glossy with four-color printing, <clears throat> let's not do that. Let's be mad and let's have six-color printing. Instead of making a magazine to be uh, read and tossed away, try to make it more like a book you collect and make it something people want to save. Uh, give it perfect binding so it's more like a book. <clears throat> and then put stri stripes on the sleeves so that if you're looking at 40 magazines on a bookshelf, there's one that you'll always recognize, and that'll be wired. So that's about playing with the context, and or that's an example of it. <clears throat> and the last one, uh, continuity, that, that's, that's one word for it. Uh, I, what we mean, mean by that is, as, as hard as it is to create something new, and I think it's almost impossible to create something new. I, I think we, we, we maybe did it two or three times on good days in our whole life. Mm -hmm. But as hard as that is, it's much harder to sustain that over time. <clears throat> so that's what the continuity is about. You know, once you get out of the gate and you've made a big splash, how do you uh, continue to show up without getting boring? What do you do to refresh that and make it new? Um, but at the same time, w w when you're trying to refresh things and make them new, how do you not throw the baby out with the bathwater? How do you maintain the essence of that original content? Um, so we, we try, we think, uh, on a good day, we try not to bring our personal prejudices about taste or aesthetics to a project. Uh, we, we try to let the, the particular content of a project tell us what to do. And then we try to put that in context to competition. And then we try to uh, uh, introduce enough variety in, in the way that that rolls out, that it stays fresh and surprising, but always recognizable. Is that get more to process? <laughs> We're here the rest of the week, and so yeah. it's good. See, we want, you know, it's funny, though. We, we, we're always trying to talk about something besides Wired, but Wired has this uh, yeah. <laughs> thing. It creates question marks. You're talking about spaces. Oh, go ahead. Um, what, what do you guys think of co-working or maker spaces or hacker spaces, um, spaces like that where people are kind of collaborating and working together? I think they're great. I don't know if everybody heard that question or not. It's, it's, it's you know, what do we think of co-working uh, maker spaces? Um, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's, it's shared space where, where people come together uh, just, just so that they can rub elbows. I think it becomes even more important as we get more and more tied to our little devices with our headphones in and our music on. You know, it's funny, I was talking earlier about the, the original Wired with this rule that there had to be music on and if you didn't like it, just put something louder on. You could contrast that with the current Wired, which, I mean, they're great people, and I think they make a good magazine, but you go into their offices, and it's like an effing library. Everybody in there, everyone's listening to music, but everyone's listening to their own music. And there's much lower level of, of human interaction. It's that idea of alone together. So I would assume, I, I, I think, you know, the reason we're showing that MIT space is, is, is we're, for, we're for making any space uh, looser and more ragged. You know, I think... Companies make a mistake when they try to get refined and celebrate their success and make these perfect spaces. You're better off to figure out how to maintain temporary autonomous space and let, and let it keep doing this. I mean, this, the room we're in is a wonderful example. It'd be nice to work in this room. That idea of temporary autonomous space, they, they say that 
that helps sideways thinking. So the idea as designers, and it's very hard to do, which is how do you design a space that is actually temporary? Or how do you design a space that would allow you to create in that space? So is it just empty? Or what, what are the tools? What do you use? And that's um, a lot about what we were talking about earlier this morning. Yeah. AJ. I Hi. <laughs> I love your presentation. It's been great. Oh, um, you know, it's really interesting because you guys really have talked about an evolution of an organization, which we see time and time again where, you know, when you're the startup, you're free flooring, you know, you're in the garage, you're in an open space, and then as you grow, you have more structure, but it's a little, you still got that culture, and then the bigger you get, the more structure surrounds it, yep. more protocols, more standardization. Yep. And then there comes a point where the organization says, we want to go back to where <laughs> we were and start where we, you know, where we started. And HP is a great example. I don't know if you've seen their new space, but they actually, I mean, it's a huge floor plan of tons of workstations, and in between, they have built garages. <laughs> and they're not a literal garage, but it's, it, it does the same things that they did in the garage. And, you know, I just think your story is amazing, and I love that whole evolution you guys went through. So one question for you is, did you leave because you were too standardizing? Oh, too much we were the, exhausted. No. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, none of the people that started Wired left by choice. Um, we uh, tried, I think what happened to us is what happened to everybody, is the internet hit us over the head. You know, we, we were going to be a little magazine business, and um, y y I don't know if you know the numbers on magazines about, uh, and it's probably changing now that magazines are disappearing, but at that time, there were about 200 new magazines a year, and after two years, usually about two of them were still in existence, and it took about five years to become, to break even with a magazine, and a, and a magazine launch budget in the 1990s might be about 40 million if you're Time Warner. Well, we launched Wired with $250,000, and, and it was gone before we got it on press for the first issue. <laughs> and so that's why that first year was so tight. Um, but, oh, so um, anyway, anyway, so we're making the magazine, and, and we actually were uh, making money with the magazine by the end of the first year, unheard of. And if the, and if the World Wide Web had not come along that very mm -hmm. year, uh, everything would have been fine. But the web came along, and we thought, we have well, to how could we not money. make websites? You know, yeah. this is what we're about. You know, this is we're, 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 uh, so we, we took ourselves from the business of reporting on the future to trying to help create it, uh, which was a good theory, but it took every penny we ever made and, and put it over here into R&D. We made a lot of amazing technology. Uh, uh, you know, we made uh, a site called The Netizen, which was the first blog. We, 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 you know, we did a number of things first. You know, sometimes it's, it's a good thing to be first. Launching the magazine was, uh, you know, that worked to be, to be first in that space. It, it turned out to be very uh, tricky to be first with, uh, with websites. Anyway, we decided uh, to do an IPO. The IPO didn't work. We had to get private financing, and there were conditions on that, you know, venture capital kind of conditions. And after a year, the guys came to us and they said, uh, we're gonna, we'd like to sell the business. We'd like to sell digital separate from the magazine and we'd like to do it now. And we said, this is in 97. So we said, would you mind waiting a year? Because you know, if you wait a year, you can probably quintuple your money and, and not incidentally ours. And they said, no, we're happy to double our money. So, so that's what happened. Uh, the decision was taken away from us. Uh, the magazine was sold to Condé Nast, which is kind of like for us, like the invasion of the body snatchers you know, at the time. You know, the, the day they walked in the door, they turned off the music and took it out of the building. You know? <laughs> So, and then a few weeks later, we, we went out the door, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then Wired Digital was sold to a company, uh, one of many digital companies that no, that no longer exists, called Lycos. And then the craziest thing of all is when Condé Nast bought Wired, they didn't buy Wired.com. So for 10 years, Wired.com was made by a different company from the magazine. And then finally, I think just maybe one or two years ago, Cy Newhouse finally bought, bought Wired.com. And, and so finally... Wired is wired. But. but it probably was a good thing. I mean, you go, you go to a certain spot, and, and it's that thing of pushing the entrepreneurs out the door, and then it becomes a different culture. And now if you go back to Wired now, they're, they're just wonderful people there, and they're very excited about what they're doing. And it's a different culture, but the transition to get to there 
uh, they probably just needed to get rid of all of us old dogs and, and actually a lot of young ones because most of the, uh, John and me and Lewis and Kevin Kelly were by far and away the oldest people. I'd have people coming to me that I'd learn later weren't even out of high school that wanted to sleep on the couch and work there. And, and that was the kind of environment we, That's right. we the, created. The four of us were the only people in the building over 40, and yeah. I think everybody else was sort of average age 23. So, yeah. so that's another thing. Barbara and I ended up being you know, the, the mom and dad for this, uh, this crew as well. A lot of hormones swishing around in there. Yeah. 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 I was wondering how, how that works. So if you guys started the company, right, and then you go to investors, so they basically, do they have complete control or partial control over what happens for well, the, to the company? Well, that's an it depends, you know. <laughs> um, every situation is different. In, in our case, um, and I think this is typical, um, they put in this money and they said, okay, you, you need to agree to meet certain financial goals by X date. <laughs> and you know, we came so close. We were 98% of the way there. But since we weren't 100, they had the power to pull the switch. So uh, we, we just about killed ourselves trying to pull that off. So at the end of the day, we, you know, the magazine launch was kind of against all odds, but then we just couldn't quite beat the venture capitalists at their own game. You know? So it's too bad. Yeah, in the back there. Um, <coughs> as someone who's been involved with magazines most of my life as editor and advisory board, are magazines even relevant anymore? Are magazines even relevant anymore? Well, you're basically referring to the container, I think. Uh, um, I mean, you're not asking whether or not um, news, opinion, advice, analysis is relevant, because obviously that's human nature. So we're really talking about what's the container. Um, strangely enough, we're, we've been in talks for nine months now with a company that thinks they want to launch a new national magazine. I think they're insane. <laughs> Um, maybe they know something I don't. I hope, I hope they do, because uh, you know, if it happens, we'll, we'll, we'll put our best energy into it. Uh, but I think, I think the writing's on the wall. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we were saying that you know, uh, basic information <coughs> was definitely going to gravitate to the web. And so, so maybe, maybe there's a space for uh, uh, analysis and opinion that, uh, that you value. Um, but I, I almost think it's just going to be a question of habit. It's, it's, almost, it's demographics now. You know, the only place where newspapers make money are Florida and Phoenix. Guess why? It's where the, it's all the people are that grew up reading them. I mean, is, any students in here read newspapers uh, physical in a physical newspaper? form on an on a often, uh, frequent basis? Some, some hands. Okay. How many people, though, read it online? They read it on their phone? Yeah. Uh, most people in other countries read all of their media on their phone. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's more of an issue right now for newspapers, um, but just because of their daily schedule. Uh, but, but it's the same issue for magazines. It's, um, I, I, don't, I don't think the web or, or even the iPad have done a particularly wonderful job of, of making, they don't necessarily make a better product yet, uh, editorially or even interface-wise uh, on an iPad or on the web, uh, but they have immediacy. So, you know, you can't beat that. What we were trying to do with Wired, and I think it becomes even more crucial for a magazine these days, is can you create something that is you, something you want to leave on your desk, something that is an object, so that its value is not in the immediacy of it, but it's more in the something you want to refer to, hold, uh, the interface works very simply, and it's, and it's beautiful to refer to um, yeah. and leave. To the degree that magazines have a future, right now it's, it's a demographic thing. I think if, if you have subject matter that is aimed towards an older audience, that, then you'll have some readership. But is that, is that national? Is that hundreds of thousands? Or is it you know, 27,000? Um, uh, you guys, are you familiar with Lapham's Quarterly? It's been around for four or five years. Uh, it, it's by Lewis Lapham, the guy who was the editor of Harper's Magazine. And he refers to it as a... Uh, uh, the magazine of history and ideas. And it's really a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, it comes out uh, once a quarter. It's a hardbound book. It's beautiful. And he takes a single idea uh, once a quarter, and then he goes back and uh, his, he and his researchers go back, and they research all of uh, recorded human thought about that idea, and then they package it once a quarter. So it's a little bit like a hard copy of 
of Wikipedia or Google if you had the time to do the research, but since you don't, why not buy this thing and read it? And then along with that, he commissions new pieces by interesting writers. Uh, so so it's, it's this wonderful, deep slice of context in a world where context is starting to get erased. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, 60 in December, and I'm starting to feel like an old guy because I'll, I'll talk to 20-year-olds, and, I, and I, don't get the, I don't get this a sense, and I'm generalizing, sorry, that I don't get the sense that folks are nearly as preoccupied with the, with the past as, as my generation was. And, and then, so I worry about that in terms of this notion of context. You know, it's, it's too easy to make the same dumb mistakes over and over again if we forget what we just did wrong the last time. Anywho. Well, John, Barbara, thank you. It's, um, thank you. Sorry, I'm sure we'll uh, you'll catch up with them in a minute. Thank you.